All right, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here this morning. It's a great pleasure to welcome you at HSA, whether you're a student, alumni, visitors, friends, uh, colleagues. Uh, we're very happy to have you here for, those, uh, for this first session of the uh, Climate Days at HSA. Um, so my name is Eric Perrache, I'm the Dean of the school. And very quickly, uh, maybe two, uh, two thoughts before, uh, before we start with, uh, with a great speaker today. The first one is um, when you look at uh, the past two or three years, we've seen a lot of uh, lack of trust in science. And, um, you know, it really popped up during COVID, but I think it's been there for many years when you talk about climate. It's been uh, very much commented by some of, by one of our colleagues, Yann Algon at HEC, who worked a lot on trust. And uh, it's particularly heavy and important when you talk about climate. And clearly, I strongly believe that, you know, leaders that deny science are a liability. So uh, it's, uh, it's important that we talk about science. The second one is that there is a growing movement, mainly in the youth, about eco-anxiety. But at the same time, we spend a lot of, much of our time, a lot of our time talking about the problems. You go in meetings, we talk about problems. You go to a show, we talk about problems. And I strongly believe we should focus a lot on solutions sometimes more than on problems, or at least when we understand the problems, we need to talk about solutions. And I was very happy to attend a, a conference a couple of days ago where some of the very famous people started complaining, say, can we focus a little bit more on solutions, please, rather than only talking about the problems. And believing in science and looking at the solution, I think it's really in the DNA of an academic institution and uh, and obviously of an institution like I should say. You know, sense of responsibility and entrepreneurial spirit are two of the main values of I should say, and it really matches, I think, those two elements. But it's also a lot in the DNA of the people who are invited during those climate days. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Christian, who's gonna talk first, um, relying a lot on science, and really proposing and looking at what are the solutions that we have to manage this transition. So um, have a great conference. Uh, I'm sure it's gonna help us a lot mobilize around you know, what should be implemented. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much to all the organizers, um, faculty members, staff, it's been a Huge amount of work, uh, so thank you very much for uh, your dedication and the time you spent. And I pass the mic back to Daniel, who is going to start and present the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so I should have a microphone here. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. So my job here is just to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Christian Gollier, who is a professor of economics and executive director of Toulouse School of Economics. It's a great honor to have Professor Gollier with us today. He's probably the leading expert on the economics of climate change. And what I think makes Christian Gollier really unique is that he's not only talking to academics, but he's also capable of communicating with business people, with policymakers and a broader audience. And just for you to have a flavor about what he's done in the past, he's one of the experts on the <clears throat> IPCC. He was an author of two of the reports, and he published um, an incredible book, Le Climat Après la Fin du Mois, which kind of deals with the myopia in tackling climate change. And I cannot say more. He's, he's here with us today, and I'm so grateful. And please give it up for our keynote speaker, Professor Gollier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, 
I'm very glad to speak here to future decision maker from the industry and maybe uh, uh, for uh, the public services. Uh, the, the new minister of uh, ecological transition in France is Amélie de Montchalin, and uh, if I understand correctly, uh, she is an alumni of uh, HEC. Huh? Uh, so, so thank you for being he, for being here, trying to influence you. Uh, about how we should uh, organize society uh, to make sure that our responsibility toward future generations will be fulfilled. Um, so I, my talk, so I propose that uh, I talk for one hour so that we will have 30 minutes for uh, discussion. Um, so my talk will be divided in two pieces. Uh, one, one first piece will be about the economics and politics of, uh, of climate change. And the second part will be devoted to uh, an uh, issue of uh, more, will be more technical. I will have, however, no equation or no, no <laughs> technicalities here, just ideas. How, how can we translate our responsibility toward future generation into an operational framework uh, to help uh, industries and, 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 uh, and public administration to determine what is socially desirable in terms of sacrifices to be, make, to be made today for the benefits of the future. Uh, so first, <laughs> yes, as, as Loïc, uh, Loïc said earlier, uh, we live in a, in, a, in a complex world. We live in a complex world where, in France in particular, we are all aware of the fact that when we emit CO2, we generate damages for, for the future. So this is well understood and accepted in France. So there is clearly a, a, a right perception of we must do something. So there is a consensus about that, but there is absolutely no consensus about what should be done, who should do that, when, who should pay for that, and what, what, what kind of transformation of our uh, society, this free market economy, uh, should be done in order to make sure that we attain, I mean, we, we really attain the target of, in terms of reduction of CO2, CO2 emissions. Uh, so, so uh, we see that every day in the uh, in the media, there is uh, immense immense frustration about inaction or inertia. We don't do enough. We we all feel that we don't do enough to reduce our emissions. At the same time, uh, this this frustration is at the same level of the absence of willingness to make sacrifices to make sacrifices that will be needed in order to make those, to break this inertia and really change our society to make sure that we attain this objective. So, so this, this is really difficult. We, the, how can we have at the same time this frustration from a large fraction of the population and this absence of willingness to move, the absence of willingness to um, those sacrifices? Because keep in mind, giving up fossil fuels, which made the prosperity of, our, uh, of, of the Western world for the last two centuries, and replace, replacing this critically important dimension of this prosperity by something else, renewables, sob sobriety, whatever, uh, that will be more costly. That is currently, given the existing technologies, those alternative sources of energy, decarbonized, are much more costly to implement and to organize, in particular, given, in, given the, uh, the intermittency of uh, renewable source of energy. So, so moving from this old world of fossil, f fossil fuels to this new world, necessarily because of globally costly, Okay, it's much more costly. Someone will have to pay, and it will be, it would be nice if this sac those sacrifices uh, are minimized, given the objective we have in mind, the two degrees Celsius or the 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's why in my book title is Le Climat Après la Fin du Mois. We have two competing objectives 
I mean, trying to support the, the, the well-being of the current generation and at the same time protecting future generation of the, of the worst scenarios related to climate change. Uh, so inertia, uh, to make sure you uh, have that in mind, remember, although we talk a lot about that, currently we are not on the right trajectory. Okay, if I take the year 1992, I take it because that was the time of the conference of Rio, Rio conference, uh, where really I believe that politicians really start to understand the problem. We emitted globally on this planet 22 gigatons of CO2. But today, we are emitting every year uh, 36 gigatons of CO2, so we increased rather than reduce uh, the, uh, our emissions. Okay, so, so we realize that we are running to a wall and rather than, than uh, uh, pushing the, uh, the, the right pedal, we are accelerating. So we, we have a, really a problem. And economists have three explanations to, uh, to, to explain why we, have, we are in this uh, uh, race for, for, uh, for inaction. Okay, the first one is when you emit CO2, when you emit CO2, you, you do not necessarily take into account of the consequence of this CO2. You, you take the advantage of this source of energy, which is cheap, and, uh, and you don't take, take into account the fact that you generate damages for the future. On the contrary, if you make efforts to reduce emission, you bear the sacrifice associated to those efforts, but you you bear zero you benefit zero of the of the of the advantage of reducing emission and reducing uh, future damage. So so the incentive to the individual incentive, when I say individual, I mean consumers, corporations, uh, uh, nations. Uh, if, I mean, we, those incentives are very limited. So, so we, have, we are in a free riding problem. Everyone expects the others to make the effort, and at the equilibrium, nobody make, makes the effort because they don't want, they, no one wants to, make, to bear the, effort, the, the sacrifice for the others. So, second, second reason uh, tragedy of the, of the horizons. Okay? Uh, we know from the, from the climatologists and art sciences that, that reducing emission, uh, or, or, I mean, emitting CO2 today, uh, this CO2 will stay for a very long period in the atmosphere, uh, uh, decades and centuries. So uh, the consequence is that, on average, it takes 80 years to, uh, to, to see the materialization of the benefits of reducing emission today. Okay, so we are short-termists, okay? Markets are short-termists, but why markets are short-termists? Because we are ourselves short-termists. Okay, and I will, the, I will devote the second part of my presentation, presentation uh, uh, to this uh, notion of short-termism and the importance of taking into account the very distant future in our uh, evaluation of the uh, short-term actions. So, and so markets are short-termism, but, but, uh, but democracies are also short-termism because democracies is the dictatorship of the present. Only the current generation votes in the, in the National Assembly, and there is no representation of the future generation. So why, why uh, politicians uh, should uh, take care of the long term, particularly since they are elected only by the current voters? And the last, the last issue, the last reason we don't see much uh, change in our way of reducing our emissions, that's called carbon leakage. One, when one specific nation decides to reduce it, its emission, it will bear the cost. I mean, they will, we will lose jobs, we will lose wealth, uh, we, will use, we will lose purchasing powers for the benefits of globally, globally reducing CO2 emissions, but in fact, no, because if the other countries around do not penalize 
emissions of CO2, industries which just move to the other side of the frontier continue to emit the same amount of CO2 or even more. Uh, and so that will not change anything. So this, those carbon leakage, the fact that uh, countries that uh, penalize the emitters of CO2 will just see their, uh, the, the, those emissions move to the other side of the, of the frontier, generate this problem that even your sacrifice will have zero global benefits because you do not globally reduce emissions. Okay, so the, this these three um, issues uh, may explain why we don't see much, uh, we don't see much uh, impact of our, uh, of our <laughs> consciousness of this issue of climate change into actions. Uh, moreover, uh, many people live in the, in the world uh, with, with an, an utopia of a happy transition. Okay. Pe I mean, and you, when you hear politicians, and you will hear Pascal Canfin uh, after this presentation, uh, but many others, uh, they, 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 don't want, they don't want to see uh, people having to make sacrifices for uh, fighting climate change. Okay? Uh, uh, the blood, tears, sweat should be the credo of the politicians to the population to tell them we have, we have collectively and individually a social responsibility toward future genera generation, and we must make sacrifices. We may, every one of us should be mobilized to make sacrifices to reduce our emission in order to make sure that future generation will be able to continue to live on this planet. And that's not what we hear. What we hear from the politicians and in, in the media is that, you know, Energy transition, great. We will create millions of jobs. We will reduce the, uh, the electric invoice of the households, and so on. And the reality is obviously completely different. Okay, so it's very hard in if all politicians say the same thing, explain that we will have all those good things of reducing uh, climate change, uh, reducing emissions, I mean, it's very hard to have a, a, a discourse of reality and, and, and a discourse of making sacrifices. Um, so, so Pascal Canfin, for example, uh, is, uh, is the president of the um, Environmental Committee of the European Parliament. He was very happy to announce two weeks ago that uh, there will be no carbon pricing in Europe for mobility and resi residential heating. Okay, so, so <laughs> and why? Well, because we have the Yellow Vest movement, and, and we d he doesn't want to have a Yellow Vest movement in Europe, and, and, and the Yellow Vest movement came from the fact that we put a price on carbon. The price of carbon, as I will explain in a few minutes, is the t translation to reality of the fact that we need to make efforts. Without this carbon pricing, it will be very hard to organize society, to uh, attain the two degrees Celsius target. Excuse me. So here is a picture of Jean Tirol. Jean Tirol is my colleague in Toulouse. I wrote different papers with him. Um, in particular, uh, um, well, his Nobel Prize uh, 2014. And he, uh, we wrote together a report to the government named the Blanchard-Tirol report. Uh, and at the, at the occasion of this report, he get uh, this uh, uh, newspaper, uh, newspaper article uh, where he has this uh, caricature of him, uh, and, and it's related to climate change because, well, and when we think about climate change, we always think about someone else having to make a decision. The government, ExxonMobil or BNP Paribas. But, but in reality, every one of us are responsible for the emissions related to our consumption. 
Okay, so here is an example of the issue. Uh, Jean Tirole pitches tomatoes uh, in, the, in the market in, in Toulouse. He has the possibility to purchase French tomatoes at the price of 2.3 euros per kilogram. Or he can purchase uh, Spanish tomatoes at a price of 1.75 euros. Well, in Spain, there is more, more sun, so it's more natural to raise tomatoes in, 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 in Spain and in, in France. But the problem is, as you know, and so, and so the cost of producing com growing tomatoes in Spain is smaller, and therefore the price is smaller. The problem is, when you purchase Spanish, Spanish tomatoes in Toulouse, there is uh, emissions associated to the transportation of this, those tomatoes to Toulouse. And uh, Jean Tirol is aware of his responsibility to climate change. And he raised the question, should, be, should, he be, uh, should it be natural or, or responsible, more responsible to purchase French tomatoes because they, are emitted, they emitted less CO2? But you see, the price is relatively severe. I mean, you need to purchase a at the price of 2.3 rather than 1.75. So, so there is this issue of, is, it, this, is this green action of purchasing local food rather than food imported, like this one, is it something that we should do? What, what should we be ready to pay in extra of the minimum to reduce our emission? Okay, that's really the question that is behind that. And, and I, I like this story of the tomatoes because it puts the issue in front of your decision, not the decision of others. Okay, because currently I feel this frustration from many people come from the fact that they think they, are, they cannot do anything, but someone else can do something for climate change. No, in reality, we should, every one of us, we are confronted. We, we, we are polluters. We emit CO2. And there is a question about what, what, what should be the intensity of our efforts to reduce those, those emissions. Here is an example of a list of eight different actions whose consequences, among else, do re to reduce emissions of CO2. So I will not spend too much time on that. The, the price tag on the bottom of the box is the relevant, uh, uh, the, the important point that I want to make. There are, there are a lot of different actions. D purchasing French tomatoes is just a small example. There are a myriad of other actions that, uh, that imply that you reduce emission. I was talking with the taxi driver this morning coming here. He's also an installer of heat pumps. Okay. And so we spent 30 minutes talking about heat pumps. Uh, that's a very interesting issue. Heat pumps is not in the, uh, uh, yes, uh, the third example on the top. Uh, heat pump is costly. I mean, talking about energy these days is difficult because the Ukraine, Ukraine crisis. Uh, so I hope this Ukraine crisis is temporary. Let me forget about that. Those numbers. Those numbers are pre-Ukraine uh, crisis, okay? Or post-Ukraine crisis, let me say like that. Uh, so, it's cheaper to, to heat yourself uh, using natural gas than using heat pump. Heat pump, is, you know, installation cost is quite, is quite large. But when you make the computation of uh, the installation cost, but plus the fact that with the heat pump you don't use to purchase natural gas, um, it's, not, it's not individually desirable, it's costly, in fact, to purchase the heat pump rather than the, than, than the standard um, um, system with the natural gas. And when you make the comparison, of course, the heat pump does not em emit much less CO2 than, uh, than natural gas, in particular in, in countries like in France, where electricity is almost completely decarbonized. But it's more costly. So you can do a very simple computation 
and engineers do that every day, uh, where you look at what's the additional cost and by how much you reduce emission. And when you do that computation, it costs around 50 euros per ton of CO2 saved for a household that, that decide to make the effort to purchase a heat pump rather than to stay with natural gas. For per, per ton of CO2 not emitted, it will cost the household 50 euros. And so uh, other action, uh, just seven, seven others of them are, are presented here. Another example is reduce, reducing speed on highway. Okay? When, you, when you drive slower, you emit less CO2, but you take more time. Uh, and you also die less often uh, when you drive uh, more cautiously, uh, slower. So when you make the computation, when you uh, put a value on your life, when you put a value on your time, reducing speed as a cost for you, it's a form of sobriety, okay, take more time, uh, but you emit less of CO2, When you make the same kind of computation, when you put a value over your time, you are able to estimate the cost per ton of CO2 saved to speed to reduce your speed on highways. And so uh, friends from the Conseil General du Développement Durable of the Ministry of Ecology make the estimation of a few years ago uh, that it costs around 500 euros per ton of CO2 saved to reduce your speed on highway from 130 km per hour to 110. And so on and so on. Okay? The, the, the pre or post Ukraine crisis, easiest or lowest cost of reducing CO2 in Europe would be to switch, to switch sorry, from uh, coal to natural gas to produce electricity. Okay? I agree. Producing electricity with natural gas is not sustainable in the long run, but in the medium run, from now to until probably 2030-2035, natural gas is an efficient way to produce electricity, in particular taking into account the intermittency of producing electricity with solar and wind energy. And so it costs less than 50 euros per ton of CO2, uh, CO2 saved to switch from coal to natural gas. Sorry, again, it's pre or post uh, <laughs> Ukraine crisis. Uh, in the short run, it's likely that we need to increase coal, coal production uh, in Europe uh, to support the potential embargo of uh, natural gas from Russia. Okay, so you just what I want to say here that you are, there is a myriad of way of reducing CO2 emissions. Those decisions are under control of the consumers, for some of them, for, under the control of corporations, for others, uh, under the control of public, public powers, for, for, the, for the others. And so the question is, okay, some are very costly, others are much cheaper. Of course, if we want to attain the objective of reducing emissions of CO2 at the least cost for the people, and keep in mind the yellow vest movement, we, <laughs> I mean, fighting climate change is one objective, but prosperity is another objective. You like it or not, it's what people like. Okay, so we need to, uh, to, to make a compromise between the end of the month and the end of the, of the world, Doing that is we do it if we minimize the cost per ton of CO2 saved. So the, the right strategy is to realize, to implement all actions with the smallest cost per ton, per ton of CO2 saved. In other, world, in, in other words, this means that you need to put a, a maximum cost per ton of CO2 saved to determine which action should be performed and which action should not be performed. Okay, because their cost per ton of CO2 saved is larger than the social benefits 
of this, redu of this reduction of CO2. <laughs> okay, so you, you, we need to perform a cost-benefit analysis. We, we cannot just say, this is green, let's do it. No. Some of those actions are so expensive. Okay, they are so expensive that it would be crazy socially to do it because it would affect the purchasing powers of the household so much per tons of CO2, of CO2 saved, at the same time that there are other actions which are much cheaper per ton of CO2 saved that we don't do it. Okay? One typical example is we, we, <laughs> we try to develop in Europe, in France in particular, electric, electric vehicles. Currently, it costs around 400 euros per ton of CO2 saved to replace a thermic vehicle by an electric vehicle. At the same time, where we just do not eliminate coal from the electricity mix in Poland and in Germany. In Poland, 90% of the electricity is produced by coal, which is the worst stuff in terms of emissions of CO2. In, in, in Germany, it's 45% of the electricity mix is from coal. In fact, it's not coal, it's lignite. It's the worst form of coal you can imagine on this planet. Okay, so we do things which are very costly and we don't do things which are much cheaper for the same objective. So, so we need to put a value on carbon. That's the idea. We need to put a value on carbon that is what's the benefit, what's the social benefits associated to reducing emission. Okay, we know the cost previous slide, we need to put the benefits of value on doing those things. Okay? If we don't do that, you will let uh, uh, crazy people impose crazy things that are likely to reduce emissions of CO2, but at a very large cost for society. So we need to organize society in such a way that only the actions that are the least cost per ton of CO2 saved are implemented. And in order to express this idea, we need to put a value on carbon, maybe say 100 euros per ton of CO2, in order to tell people you sh what is socially desirable is you should do all actions that cost you less than 100 euros per ton of CO2 saved, okay? That's th th this discourse, I mean, we need to, th I mean, again, everything green is not necessarily socially desirable, okay? And so we need to, in this double objective of reducing emission and, 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 and organizing prosperity, we need to put a value on carbon. And so the question is, the next question, that's the second part of my presentation, is what should be that, that, that value? Okay. Okay, so you, I'm, I'm talking here at HSC, and as Eloïc said, I also talk a lot with, with the, uh, um, corporate, corporate people. Um, this idea, of putting a value to carbon is already well practiced in, in, in corporations which use an uh, internal carbon price. Okay? More and more industries and, and corporations use an internal carbon price. That's exactly that idea. Okay? Within a corporation, the executive committee should put a value to carbon and tell all business units in, within the corporation use that specific carbon value in order to determine we, whether your action under your control should be made or not. And do them, uh, do only those which cost the corporation less than the carbon value that I give you to use, that I tell you to use. Okay, so that's the idea. And this idea, you can use it for industries. You can also use it in banking industries, in the financial industries. Okay, for example, I support the idea and I, I've been defending this idea for 15 years with a little, little success up to recently. You all, uh, SRI fund should use the carbon value. 
Okay, in order to determine their portfolio, their optimal portfolio for a climate fund, they should, they should evaluate the specific asset within this portfolio by subtracting from the value of the, the, the full capitalization of the, corpora of the, of the corporation, the, fl the, the present value of the flow of future emission of CO2 given the current uh, capital structure of the company. And given this cl climate adjusted value of the society, determine the optimal portfolio using the standard quantitative methods used in finance. Uh, so that's, that's the idea, and I say the same thing for central banks. Uh, I also talk about labeling. You probably heard about the EU taxonomy, where we are talking about whether natural gas and nuclear should be labeled green or not. Those things are completely going nowhere because those taxonomy, this taxonomy, this way of labeling is not science-based, okay? The science-based is just the simple science that I presented here. It's, it's almost trivial, just it's maximization under constraint. Force us to put a value to carbon, and we should do that for all activities uh, in the economy. Okay, so up to now, I didn't talk about tax, carbon tax or a market for permits. I just told you we should put a value on something we consider in our society as important, that is in particular uh, the climate and our responsibility toward future, future generation. It's, it's just uh, putting a value on something. Now we can think about how to organize a society or society as a whole to make sure that those actions that we find to be socially desirable because the cost per ton of CO2 saved is smaller than the, va the carbon value, how can we organize society to make sure that every polluter take into account of this value in, its dis in his or her decision? Okay. We know that in a free market economy, that will not be done. Okay, because of the free riding problem. I, every one of us, every na nation, every corporation, just look at the cost. The benefits of reducing emissions is for the world, for humanity. So <laughs> economists have a very simple, uh, probably too trivial to be understood. Uh, the answer is we should reform the free market economy, the, the capitalistic economy, by just imposing a tax, a, a carbon price. So I switch here from a carbon value to a carbon price, meaning you will have to pay. Okay? You want to emit CO2, you pay for the damage associated to that. That's the, that's the uh, polluter pay principle, that's simple as that. Okay? And it's an idea that has been developed developed by an economist named Arthur Pigou in 1920 in a famous book on the, on the topic. Okay, just, just if, you're, if the price you have to pay to emit CO2 is equal to the carbon value, well, when you will determine whether you will make this effort to reduce your emission, you will be incentivized to look at one side your cost associated to reducing this emission with, this, with the carbon price you have to pay if you don't do the action. And therefore, you see that you, this, with this strategy, which is very simple, putting a tax or a market for permit where the price of the permit is equal to the carbon value, that's easy to perform. Okay. And this simple action implies that we align the myriad of private interests of corporations, consumers, whoever, with the common good. Because you make sure that every polluter uh, will behave as if he or she is the victim on his own behavior. Because if the carbon value is equal to the marginal damage, 
uh, he will pay for that damage. And so he will in be incentivized to take into account the bad things that he do or she, do, she does for the other. Okay, so, so here in this slide, you see I switch from a carbon value to a carbon price. I switch from the issue of what of determining what is socially desirable in, in any in any economy we can think about, planet economy, free market economy, mixed economy, to a mechanism to, ren to renovate our, uh, our capitalistic economy by just adapting this economy to this, the biggest market failure we can think of, which is climate change. And we do that by putting a price on carbon. And this, if this price is equal to the damage, uh, you, you see that we align the myriad of, of private interests with the common good. There are different issues associated to that. First issue, most people in France have hard time to understand that prices affect behavior. The way we live, our, our way of life, is intrinsically affected by the price vector. Simple example of that, look at the price of gasoline, of gasoline in Europe and in the US over the last four decades. In, in the US, the, carb, the price of gasoline has been systematically 50% uh, smaller than in Europe. And look at the consequence of this difference in price on the characteristics of the vehicles in the two continents. Okay? In the US, engine, uh, uh, engine of cars are much less energy efficient, cars are much bigger, the weight of cars is much larger, and so on. So prices affect our decision. It's not true, as we heard by the, from the yellow vest, that we cannot do anything with the increased carbon tax. It's not in, probably it's true in the short run, but in the long run, people facing a larger price of gasoline will switch to a lighter car. Maybe some of them will, will switch to an electric car. Others will go public transportation and so on, okay, when, when it exists. Okay, so, so this, this works, okay? And we know that when we, on average, in the long run, when you increase the price of gasoline by 10%, we reduce uh, uh, gasoline purchase by 8%. Uh, gasoline, yeah. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's a very efficient way to uh, induce people to act. Uh, however, however, there is, um, there is, of course, a difficulty. Uh, and and the difficult one, one of the main difficulties is social uh, inequalities. Okay, it's true in, in the Western world, the share of individual budget devoted to purchase of energy is decreasing with income. So wealthier people devote a, a smaller fraction of their income to purchase energy. That implies that increase, when, when you increase the price of energy, the poor will pay more. So this carbon pricing mechanism is regressive. It fights climate change, but it generates another problem, which is uh, social inequalities. However, it's true for almost any strategies to reduce emissions. Look, for example, feed-in tariff for electricity. You install a, a photovoltaic panel on your, on your roof. For 20 years in France, you get the price at which you will be guaranteed to sell your, this, this electricity to the market at the price which is much more so larger. In the 2010, it was 10 times larger than the price of electricity, the cost of electricity from nuclear power plants. So who pay for that price paid to owners of photovoltaic panel, panels? Well, you, you do it. Look at your invoice of electricity bill. Okay, you, there is a tax, okay, the, 
there is a tax whose level is around 15 percent. So 15 percent of your electricity bill is used to pay for uh, the, uh, incre the, the large price offered to people who in the, the past 15 years accepted to put a photovoltaic panel, panel on their roof. Well, you see, this, this mechanism is as regressive as the carbon taxes. Okay, why? Well, because you, everyone pays for it. Okay, and on top of that, two things. Who is able to put a photo 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 photovoltaic panels on, on a roof? Well, only owners of a, of a roof can do it. So that, that's not people in the... Uh, HLM, okay, so 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 and 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 it's a big money, okay. It's it's ten billion euros per year are paid to pay for those feed-in tariffs that have been organized over the last fifteen years in France. Second point, and that's the most important: a carbon tax generates a fiscal revenue, and this fiscal revenue can be used to target the poor and the vulnerable people. Something you cannot do for the feed-in tariff. The feed-in tariff, the money goes in the pockets of those who put those, those photovoltaic panels on their roofs. Okay. This fiscal revenue can be used and should be used to compensate the poor in, in order to make sure that they could be even be overcompensated in, in such a way that we, we could organize a a majority, a voting majority in the parliament, so combined, combining these people who win from a large carbon price on the market and those who are naturally inclined to do something for, uh, uh, to reduce emissions of CO2. So there are other issues with, uh, with those climate policies. Um, the question of should we put a, a tax on carbon or should we impose a, a market for permits? It's a technical issue in sh and it's not central. Uh, we, and we can talk about that if, we, if you want, but it's not central. Uh, carbon pricing makes the sacrifices explicit. Indeed, when the Yellow Vest uh, discovered that on January the 1st, 2019, they will have to pay three cents per liter of gasoline uh, more at the pump. They disagree. Okay, so it's a very visible way to tell you you need to make sacrifices. Those feed-in tariffs, nobody understands anything. People do not realize that they pay that in their electric electric bill, and that's and uh, no there is there were no single yellow vest that mentioned this problem. Okay, so carbon tax is an efficient way to get to the objective, but it's very visible. And so it's politically difficult to bear, and Pascal Canfin is unable to bear that. Just to introduce the debate for the next round table. <laughs> because I'm not sure I will be able to talk at this round table, <laughs> I prefer to prepare you for this debate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only do we need a carbon price, we also need a credibility for the future carbon price. Okay, that's critically important because most of the actions to reduce emissions of CO2 is not whether tomorrow I will use my my bicycle to go to my to my job. It's more about whether I will switch to electric car, whether I will go to a heat pump for my heating system in my home. It's for a corporation whether to switch from, a, from a, a power plant using natural gas to a, a power plant using biofuels or whatever. Uh, it's whether to switch from, a, from a coal to nuclear. All those investments last for decades. Okay? A nuclear power plant will last for 60 years. So people who make those investments need to have some visibility about what the competitors will have to pay if they don't do some th those things that are costly uh, but, but uh, uh, socially responsible. 
Okay, so the credibility of the future carbon price is important, and there we have a problem with markets, with markets for permits. You know, the volatility on the ETS market has been extremely large, uh, and so the market transferred the uncertainty from the community to the uh, green investors, and that makes that generates some slowness in the transition to. Uh, to renewables. So there is an issue there. So I propose to either have a European treaty where I would, we would impose a minimum price on, on, on the permits growing at a predetermined rate. OK, for the last uh, 15 minutes of my talk and before the discussion, I would like to switch to my own my, my, my domain, I mean, my, my historical domain of research in my career. So I'm, um, I'm a decision theorist under uncertainty. I mean, I'm not a public economist who usually talk about this problem of taxing. Um, and so my interest in my research over the last 30 years has been to think about what should be the carbon price? What should be this carbon value? Should it be 20 euros? Should it be 300 euros per ton of CO2? You realize it's a critically important issue. So currently in France, we pay 45 euros per ton of CO2 on our, uh, on our gasoline and, 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 and domestic fuels. And we pay indirectly 90 euros for our electricity uh, and other um, goods produced by European industries. Because these sectors, electricity and industry, have to purchase permits on the market, on the EU ETS market. Uh, and the current price on that market is around 90 euros. OK, so 45 euros, 90 euros. Should it be one of the two? Should it be 200? You see, the larger the common price, the faster we go, will go to uh, a, a decarbonated, a decarbonized economy. So, so behind this question of the carbon value, this is the, there is this issue of what's our responsibility toward future generation? Should we go very fast, make a lot of sacrifice today, or should we rather wait um, some more time to be able to adapt, uh, waiting for uh, those uh, innovation, green innovation, to make those transformation at a lower cost. So to, just to give you an illustration of the debate among economists about that, here is a, a little story, a, a sad story, in fact. So under Obama, the carbon price, the carbon value, I'm sorry, the carbon value that has been fixed by an uh, interagency commission uh, that met in 2013 and 2016 was around, well, that is around 75 euros per ton of CO2. How do they get to those, to those numbers? Well, they use a big, they use different models. With, uh, with climate modules, economic modules, uh, uh, describing the, the economic dynamics and the cl climatic dynamics with the oceans, the atmosphere, and all those things together. The big name for, for those models is William Nordos, Nobel Prize winners of 2018. Uh, that was an advisor, by the way, of this commission. They use a discount rate of 3%. So how do they get the 75 euros per ton of CO2? They, they just predict the evolution of damages, climate damages generated by the increased concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And they look at what happens when you increase by one ton of CO2 your emission today to this flow of damages. Okay, so when you emit one more ton of CO2 today, there will be larger concentration for decades and, and, and centuries, and therefore a little larger damages borne by, future, by, by the generation to come. And so they discount this flow of increased damages, 
and this discounted flow of damages is the carbon value. Okay. So of course, the critically important dimension of this issue is the discount rate you use. You are a business people, you know what the discount rate. You also know that the discount rate is particularly important parameter when you have a flow of uh, a long, a long term flow, a long lasting flow of, of cost and benefits. This is the case here. On average, 80 years, uh, the, 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 the duration the technical term for that. The duration of this flow is 80 years. So the discount is very important, and this slide is illustrates that. So be, under Obama, they use a, a discount rate of 3%. So, so they penalize the future, but not too much. And that, that generates a relatively large carbon price of 75 euros. Well, and then you know the story, at least poli at the political level, Donald Trump was elected in 2016, uh, and he decided to uh, impose uh, a new meeting of this interagency commission and tell them, you know what? You know, sir, the over the last 20 years, the official discount rate in the US has been 7%. It's an obligation of all public commission in the US to use seven person, not three person. So please revise your computation and come back to me next month. Tell me what's the carbon price, given the fact that you made the mistake of using three person as a discount rate rather than the official discount rate of seven person. The answer is the, dis the value of carbon using a seven person discount rate is only five euros per ton of CO2. And therefore, Obama, uh, sorry, Donald Trump, under the Trump administration, the carbon value has been reduced to five euros per ton of CO2, meaning there were no <laughs> obligation to do anything to reduce emission. Okay, so this is just an illustration of the importance of using uh, the, of, of the impact of the discount rate on the value of carbon. And the discount rate is really the parameter that is critically important when we think to any action, when the evaluation of any action associated to the sustainability of our economy. So, if I, and by the way, if I use a discount rate of zero person, so philosophers think we should not penalize the future. We should consider that one euro for the future generation should be valued one, as one euro today. The carbon value should be something one to equal to 1,000 euros per ton of CO2. Okay, so, so, so this, this discount, the fact we penalize the future has a very important role on the, on the value of uh, we should put on the carbon and therefore on the intensity of our efforts to reduce emissions. So why do we discount? Why, why the hell do we penalize the future? This is, this is so short-termist. We, we put so much value on, on our well-being, not enough on the well-being of future generation. So, so why do we discount? Well, you in finance, you know, we discount because there is, a soci there is a cost of capital, there is an opportunity cost to capital, and we, if we invest in the energy transition, we will not be able to invest in other things. Correct. But there is a deeper reason we discount. There is a deeper reason why those people from the interagency commissions under Obama and Trump put a penalty to benefits that occur in the more distant future. And the reason is inequality aversion. Okay? So for a minute, please forget about climate change, forget about uh, carbon value. Let us, let me make a focus. Oh, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I make the translation to French to English <laughs> during the weekend and I realized that I didn't change, translate the title of this slide, sorry about that. Um, so so let, let me talk uh, for a minute to about, about inequalities and inequality aversion. Let me think of an hypothetic situation where we have a society where half of the population is wealthy and half of the population is poor. 
Okay, and suppose that the wealthy consume twice as much as the poor. Okay, twice as much as the poor. So the very simple the hypothetical situation. And you have a government which has the possibility to choose between two different policies, economic policies. In, in the policy W for wealth, for wealthy, uh, for, the, in the, for the policy W, every wealthy person will get one more euro to consume. And, z and zero for the poor. And for the policy P, P for the poor, every, uh, if this policy is implemented, every poor person will get T euros and the wealthy will get nothing. T is smaller than one. For example, suppose T is 0 0.5. So under the policy P, everyone get, every poor gets 50 cents. The question I have for you, is which policy do you prefer? Okay, it's a difficult issue. Uh, the policy W is nice because it's maximized the impact on, on, on GDP. Okay, GDP will be more increased with policy W than with policy P. But of course, policy W increase inequalities. Okay, so, so you have to make a compromise between two adverse objectives, two opposite objectives, maximizing wealth or GDP or uh, fighting inequalities. Okay, uh, the economists that to, to whom I raise the question, I mean, I look at their, their writing and I observe that the vast majority of my fellow economists specialized in this domain and you have big, big names there, uh, prefer the policy P. Hmm? Prefer if T is equal to 0 0.5, they prefer the policy P. I don't know about you. You may, may like it, think it differently, but th what that's what I observe in the literature. So, so then f I, I, I reduce T, and I look at uh, how far I can reduce T and, and still you maintain your position to prefer P over W. Okay, that there will be, of course, a, a lower bound to T in which you will switch to preferring the policy W in spite of the fact that it increases inequalities. Okay, so, and again, I don't ask you the good to answer that question because of lack of time. What's the limit, what's the critical value of T that makes you indifferent between the two policies, what I see in the literature is that uh, uh, Kenneth Aro, uh, well, I will not cite the name, but you see them, some of them there, uh, they put a, value, a critical value of zero, uh, zero point, zero point two five, so 25 cents. So those people are indifferent between a policy which everyone, every poor get 25 cents or every wealthy get one euro. Okay? So in a sense, we put the same social value to giving seven, uh, 25 cents to a poor as to giving one euro to a wealthy. That's, you, you see, the answer to that question give me a flavor of the intensity of inequality aversion. Maybe some of you are even more inequality averse than that and should be ready to go down below t equal 0 0.5 and still prefer. Uh, the, the policy P over the policy W. Okay, so but so it's open to discussion. Here I'm an economist, I'm not a philosopher, an, an, an ethicist. This is just what I observe and, and we can talk about that and I think we don't talk enough about how to quantify, how we, imp how we value our policies you know, in France or everywhere else taking into account the social impact on the, of those policies. So that's a way to, to put a number on, on this issue. So why do I talk you about that, to you about that? I talk to you about that because in a growing economy, in a growing economy, investing increases inequalities. I mean, intergenerational inequalities. Okay, in a growing economy, future generations will be wealthier than us. And therefore, investing, meaning sacrificing our own well-being for the benefits of the future, 
potentially future generation, as in this case for uh, investing in energy, tr energy transition, you increase inequalities. So investing is bad. Investing is bad. We are risk in, sorry, in a growing economy, big, 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 big condition, in a growing economy, investing is bad because in it increases intergenerational inequalities. And therefore, there is an ethical argument for using a positive discount rate. Okay? The discount rate in that framework should be, should be perceived as the minimum internal rate of return of a safe investment that compensates for the fact that investing in this safe project increases intergenerational inequalities. Okay? That's a deep reason why in economics, so it's not it's not finance, okay? At least it's not finance as we used to teach in, in business school, okay? It's an ethical approach to carbon, uh, to asset pricing, in fact. And what I I'm telling you here is a, it's an ethical approach to asset pricing, okay? Here, specifically the risk-free rate, okay? The, the, there is a deep argument for penalizing the future in a growing economy, which is the one I just uh, presented to you. And so suppose for simplicity that we all agree, big if again, that we will continue to grow at 2% per year, that, that consumption will grow at 2% per year forever. So it means that consumption will double every 35 years. Okay? So in that world, imagine valuing a project, a safe project, that incre will increase consumption by one euro in 35 years from now. How much should we value this today? Well, that's exactly the same question as I raised in the previous slide. In the previous slide, I told you, well, at least my club of uh, specialists in the domain said, the value of one euro given to wealthy people consuming twice as much as the poor should be equal to it should be equivalent to uh, asking uh, giving tw 25 cents to the poor we are the poor in 2022 compared to the people who will live in uh, 2057 okay those people will consume twice as much consider an investment that give them one more euros to consume how should we value that 25 cents 25 cents is the present value of one euro in 35 years at the discount rate of 4%. That's the, that's the reason of this red equation on the top, on the top right. So if you, if you follow me on this slide, if you accept this, but I, again, I'm not ready to, I mean, it's, the answer to the question is it has an ethical nature, not an economic nature. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not legitimate to justify that. I just look at what others said about that. So if we are ready to say we put the same social value of giving to giving 25 cents to a poor as to giving one euro to a, to a wealthy, which consume twice as much, you should recognize that if we assume a growing economy at 2% per year, we should use a discount rate of 4% per year for safe project. Discounting is, is, no, is, is socially desirable in a growing economy. And here I give you a number. I gi even give you a number, this 4%. By the way, for economists in the room, that corresponds to the Ramsey rule. That's related to the socially desirable discount rate to the growth rate of the economy. Well, <laughs> here, I, I'm sorry, I will take another three or four minutes. Is, is it okay? Of course, this is a crazy argument. Don't you agree? As everything on the previous slide is based on the assumption of a sure growth rate of 2% per year forever. Of course, of course, my responsibility toward future generation will be very limited under this assumption. Why should I care? Why should I care about the future generation if, if those future generations will be so much wealthier than I? 
That justifies a, discount, a large discount rate of four person. Reality is we don't know. We don't know if we are the poor compared to future generations. We are not sure. We, the, the, the prosperity will continue as it has been the case for the last two centuries. After all, if we go back over the last seven millennia, growth has been there almost zero percent for most of the period. Only the last two centuries have seen two person, a two percent growth rate. Okay, uh, economic historians are telling us that uh, uh, French farmers before the French Revolution consume the same amount than a farmer under Nabucodonosor in Mesopotamia. Okay, zero percent growth rate over two millennia, over, over much more than two millennia, by the way, uh, three, three millennia. Um, <laughs> So what should I do? Should I give up this idea to try to justify have a, have a science-based approach to discounting and therefore on, on carbon value? Well, no, of course, here in the room, maybe here I see some colleagues from finance department that I should say, we should value things, we can value things under uncertainty. Okay, this is not so easy in this case because, you know, my colleague in finance will use a Brownian motion to describe the uncertainty. Not sure that we can describe collectively our belief toward this the destiny of humanity over the, last, over, the, over the next centuries and millennia using a Brownian motion. For example, uh, Brown, using a Brownian motion will necessitate determining a trend of growth. What is the trend of growth for the, for the world economy for the next two centuries? No idea. There is a big ambiguity on this number. So we need to go, compared to my colleagues in finance at HSC and everywhere else in the world, by the way, we need to describe those uncertainties in a much profound way. There are deep uncertainties. I mean, there are parametric uncertainty about what's about, you know, uh, the possibility of uh, having an even larger growth rate in the next century because we will make discovery about having access to a free energy, you know, the, 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 the fu nuclear fusion, for example, uh, which would generate uh, electricity as uh, it is done on the, on the sun. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and also, we could think about other issues uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the end of democracy. Okay, what happens if we lose democracy? Uh, we, what happens if we? I mean, I, I used to to think about one, one of the one of the most difficult valuation exercises I have I have to do in the recent past is valuing CGO. CGO is the uh, site of nuclear waste in France, in in the Ardennes. Uh, it will cost 25 billion euros to store the entire stock of uh, nuclear waste from the second generation of nuclear power plant in, in France. So it's a big thing, and and so and but this this storage will be there for millions of years. How do we value that? Okay, one of the big thing, one of the big stories I get from the people experts in the domain is what happened. What happens if we leave this nuclear waste on surfaces, which is less costly to do, but we lose the knowledge that those nuclear waste have, uh, generate uh, health issues? Okay, so that kind of thing. This, and, and you look at uh, science fiction movies, you see different way of imagining the world in the, in, the, in the distant future. Well, let me summarize here. So, big uncertainty, we should take into account of the fact that we are not so sure, to say the least, that we will continue to grow that 2% per year forever, and so I should adapt my previous arguments of using 4% in one way or another. So one way or another, which one? Well, two stories there. Story one, precaution. Okay. If I have a risk-free project, in an uncertain world where I'm not so sure that the future generation will be wealthier than I, what should I do? Should I reduce the discount rate below the 4 percent compared to the previous uh, justification or should it put it at a larger level? Well, think about yourself. 
when your, when your own future is more uncertain, what do you do? That's the same issue at the collective level. When I ask you at the, at the individual level. Okay, what do you do? When, when you learn that after all, there is not, is it not so sure you get, will get promoted in your corporation, or whatever sort of uncertainty you can imagine about your future income. Well, there is one thing we know in macroeconomics, that is when there is more uncertainty, people save more. The precautionary saving motive, John Maynard Keynes. What does that mean? It means people are ready to sacrifice more of their present. Saving, saving is the perfect example of making current sacrifices. Okay? So you save more, you make more sacrifice when your future is more uncertain. You should trans we should translate that at the collective level, and people in finance have done that over the last 30 years. Um, and so what does that mean at the collective level? We should reduce the discount rate. By reducing the discount rate, more investment projects will pass the test of a positive net present value because you reduce the penalty for the future, you increase the value of the, of the, future, the current value of the future benefits, and it's more likely that uh, it will be larger than the current cost. Okay, so you will get more precautionary investment that is symmetric to more precautionary savings at the individual level. So you should reduce the discount rate. In France, I've been working with the government on those issues. We decided last summer, using this kind of argument, exactly these two arguments, we re to reduce the discount rate to 1.2% per year plus inflation. Okay. So that's the 4% person minus the precautionary premium that I illustrated, that I just mentioned here. So that's, you see, the precautionary premium is particularly large. That's because in the model, we really take into account not only Brownian motion, as my colleague in finance do, but also more, more deeper uncertainties, deeper source of uncertainty. And then finally, there is also other issue associated to, you know, in finance, we we penalize projects that are riskier. And this riskiness is evaluated by the beta, the CAPM beta. You, you remember those things? Um, so you increase the, risk, the discount rate to be used for riskier projects. And then there is this issue of uh, whether investing in energy transition reduce or increase the risk for future generation. And th on those issues, we are just at the beginning of having discussion among that, about that among economists, so I will not go into the details. Um, anyway, let me, fin with, let me conclude with this, uh, with this slide. Uh, I propose to use a discount, uh, I propose to use uh, a, a carbon price of 150 euros, in fact, now 160 euros per ton of CO2, so that's much larger than what has been used in, in France and in, in the US, in particular in the US, much larger than the carbon tax, currently 45 euros, double the, the, the value, the price of carbon on the ETS market. Um, why do I do that? Well, we, we economists have a problem. That is, if we use the 3%, so, so I propose, I all in all, taking all sorts of risk in my model, I recommend to use a discount rate around 3% to value the, the carbon. And so that generates a carbon price around 75 euros per ton of CO2 today. This is not what I recommend. Why? Because politically, we in Paris have taken a decision. We took in 2015, in the Paris Agreement, we took a decision to having a target of two degrees Celsius. And 1.5 degrees Celsius would be better, uh, but uh, let me think about two degrees Celsius. 1.5 is extremely difficult in the current situation. The two degrees Celsius, this, the, the carbon price, that the carbon value that I propose will not do it, okay? With, with 75 euros, the value, carbon value, we will increase the average temperature on this planet to at least 3 degrees Celsius compared to uh, 19, the 1900. 
Okay, so it's much larger than the target. So meaning, if as an economist I take political decision as a, as a constraint, and so if I take that constraint of two degrees Celsius, I need to increase the carbon the carbon value by how much? Well. I see here I, I give up the idea to compare cost and, and benefits. Here I, the carbon value is just a translation of the new political target of two degrees Celsius. This two degrees Celsius target can, should be translated into a carbon budget. That is how many CO2 I can still emit in the atmosphere without uh, passing the two degrees Celsius threshold. Uh, and so this shadow price of carbon, this shadow price associated to this constraint of two degrees Celsius is around 160 euros, given the different other uncertainty we have in mind, but I will not go into the details. So you see, this 160 euros give us, give us the flavor of the intensity of the challenges we face today doing all efforts that cost us less than 160 euros, growing at something like 4% per year plus inflation, give us the flavor of the intensity of the problem. And you see the problem of acceptability is that the Yellow Vest movement in France decided it was for 50, 50 euros was too much okay, for them to bear. And so, so we have a deep issue of whether we should be we should be being able to implement that carbon value either through a mechanism where we will make sure by a command and control or ban or norms uh, tested with this cost benefit analysis where we put this value on carbon or with the carbon price or carbon tax with the redistribution of the of the fiscal revenue to the poor whether this is, is it possible to implement that in our society is, uh, is a big weather. Mm. Uh, uh, and so just to conclude, that implies that for you, the corporation, you, you, the future decision maker in the industry, you have your own issue that the markets will not be able to incentivize everyone to do what should be done. And then your problem will be to determine whether in your corporation you will be able to conv convince the exec your executive committee to, be, to do things that will hurt your company, but will generate uh, the social benefits we expect from, from, those, from, from those corporations. And there, this is not easy. Huh? This is not easy. Let me conclude with this. In a competitive world, a corporation which decides to accept larger costs to reduce its emission, and those larger costs could be not marginal. In the steel industry, decarbonizing steel production increases cost of producing steel by 30%. So if your competitors do not decarbonize their, uh, their production way, their produ the way of producing steel, if you decide to do it, the only consequence, if you will, you will kill your corporation and the emission will go to your competitor. So there is, there it's, this just to tell you that the CSR approach, asking corporation to do the good things, it's a very difficult thing to implement in a competitive world. So the conclusion, government are the only structure which have the power to organize society in the right way to provide the right incentive. CSR, it's a good, it's a good thing, but only in sectors where there is some rent to be used to pay for that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for this amazing lecture. You know, is what Eloic was saying, uh, we need science, and I think that's the right track to work. You know, the, at least the structure of the argument is crystal clear. And we can debate whether the 2 or 3% is the answer, but that's, I think, the spirit I would like to keep you in mind when you do business, cost-benefit is easy, but if you have this mindset, that's the way 
to think about those complex problems. So I don't know, we have time for two, three questions. We have a, a microphone. Who wants to go first? Miles. I thank you so much for the lecture, very interesting. Um, my question was, you talked a lot about carbon value, but didn't address carbon leakage as much relative to the carbon value. So my question is, if we institute these policies in the EU or in the US, like, how do you still solve that problem of carbon leakage and how can you get buy-in from other countries whose sectors aren't as developed? Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, this, uh, you probably heard about the Fit for 55 uh, project, uh, code name is uh, <laughs> Green, Green, um, uh, Green Pact, uh, the Pact of European, uh, in which one of the big dimension, there are two big issues in this uh, package. One is imposing a carbon price to mobility and heating, uh, sectors which represent 60% of the total emission in Europe, between 50 and 60. Um, and, 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 and that's what uh, Pascal Confin was able to kill two weeks, two weeks ago. And the other one is uh, the uh, carbo carbon border adjustment mechanism, where in Europe we will impose a, a, tax, a tax on carbon that uh, on, on any goods and services that come in into uh, the European Union uh, and this tax will be at the level of the, uh, the, 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 the emissions of CO2 generated by producing this good plus the transportation uh, at a price corresponding to the difference between the carbon price in Europe and the carbon price in the, prod in the, in the, uh, w in the countries of origin. On, the pap on paper, that's, that's simple. Uh, in fact, it's, in it's extremely difficult because you, know you need to go to the into the value chain of a product. Some of the elements are produced in different countries, but even if it's produced entirely in China, the Chinese will tell you that the electricity that has been used to produce these goods was coming from the photovoltaic panels uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the plan rather than the coal electricity produced in most of, the, of China. And uh, it will be hard to, to tell, uh, to tell the, what is the truth there. Uh, second issue, if in Europe we are not clear, crystal clear about carbon pricing, eliminating all exemption, it will be very hard to go to the WTO to tell we are putting this tax, the border tax, to level the playing field. We need, in order to level the playing field, it, it, we must have a mechanism in Europe where everyone pay the tax, the same price on carbon, otherwise we will not be uh, taken seriously by WTO. And what uh, Pascal Confin has been able to kill is the ability to have a crystal clear carbon pricing mechanism in Europe. So I think it will no, no also kill this way of eliminating carbon leakage in Europe. So that's, uh, that's a difficult issue. Thank you, Gr great lecture. I loved everything you said. You highlighted the importance of um, governments being responsible and uh, enforcing a carbon tax. How do you link that with all the energy we're putting now on the European taxonomy? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, energy on the taxonomy, I don't see so much. I'm, I, I, I look at this taxonomy issue in, in a distance, by the way. I, I, um, I've been fascinated by, um, indeed, the, um, the ability of the, of the Brussels administration to write a lot of documents about that. But I also, as I said during my presentation, I've been fascinated by the absence of principles that has been uh, driving this, uh, this taxonomy. Uh, and so, again, these issues of whether uh, nuclear uh, should be labeled as green or whether ga natural gas should be labeled as green is... Well, it's, uh, natural gas is a transition energy. We need, we, 
you cannot imagine. Look at the report in France. There is there has been an important report about the, what kind of electricity mix we should envision by the year 2050, uh, fully decarbonated. We we know that we will not be able to get uh, uh, an entire entirely renewable source of electricity, with meaning without nuclear, uh, with without having some mechanisms to store electricity when there is no sun and, the, and no wind. Uh, in the short run, we don't have uh, any such capacity. Hydroelectricity is only a marginal capacity. Uh, so we need natural gas to equilibrate the electricity market by the hour uh, for, the for the next probably 15 years or 13 years. Um, so, so natural gas is indeed not sustainable in the long run. We need to give up natural gas. But today, I don't know whether it's green, but it's a necessity in terms of cost-benefit analysis. Given that we have no alternative to store electricity, or to, to produce electricity, to supply electricity when we need it and when there is no wind and solar, the value, the social value of electricity in that, uh, in those scenarios, scenarios are, are important. So the cost-benefit analysis tell us that we need it, the, the benefits of using using uh, natural gas is larger than the cost of using natural gas, even if we use a carbon price or carbon value of 150 euros today. So, so, but but as the carbon value will increase over time, there will be one time where it will be more, more, more socially desirable to store electricity with batteries and maybe hydrogen, but with hydrogen there is still a lot of technological uncertainties. So there we don't know, when, uh, in fact, we don't know exactly at what time we will be able to give up uh, natural gas as, uh, as the only remaining source of to equilibrate the electricity market by the hour in the, in the next 20 years. So taxonomy, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because um, <laughs> um, do at the end of the day, it's a, they did the political decision. The Germany accept to uh, uh, label uh, nuclear as green, and, and the French accept to to label uh, ga natural gas as green. It's a, it's it was a, a, a win win for Germany and France, but with no economic or ethical foundation, and and that's not good. I mean, I, I believe that the EU taxonomy is already is already dead, by the way, but. Uh, Given given this absence of support, well, we have one last question, very short, and I need a short answer because we have uh, the other gentleman waiting on Zoom. So, um, yeah. hi, Christian. Thank you for this uh, nice talk. I agree with you 95 percent of what you say. There is one difficult question, difficult to answer quickly. That is, when I talk about this idea of pricing then around me, students and colleagues, some say, well, but then if you put a price on carbon, only wealthy people will be able to pollute, the price to them will be nothing, and poor people have to change their behavior. So how do you answer this? Well, wealthy people are able to do much more things than others. Um, that's, the, that's the reality of our world. Um, uh, and um, well, if you dislike that, let us reduce inequalities. Uh, let us tax uh, wealthier people more. Uh, I don't think why we should allow, why we should prohibit them to emit more CO2 at the same time they do other more things than us. I mean, so, so uh, well, your issue is about uh, wealth inequalities. We don't like that, but that's a reality. And um, we should, uh, when whether we should, some, pe some people uh, tell we should use a carbon price that is larger for wealthy people than for the people, for, for the poor people. I, I have no idea how to implement that. That's just extremely difficult. I mean, there will be second market associated to that kind of different pricing you know you know the, if you have the si two price for the same thing not only we have a allocation problem but we also have a problem of how to implement those things without without failure and corruption okay thank you so much i think we could go on for hours but we have another session coming up so one more time please give it up for christian and thanks again for coming <laughs>
So I suggest we, we take nine minutes break. We're going to start at 25 Swiss time uh, for the panel. And uh, I'm going to see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Sorry to cut you. Yes, you did. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah. If you have questions, you're going to be the first on my list. Thank you. Thank you. I like your style. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's not a big deal. Thank you. Yes. 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 All right, welcome back. For those who are arriving, just please come all the way to the front row because uh, so the guys can see some faces here. All right, while they're getting ready with the last few things, I'm just going to say hello again for this panel discussion. So the discussion is led by Katella Gulvan, who is uh, executive director of the Hoffman Global <coughs> Institute at INSEAD. And the funny thing is actually I got to know Katel uh, through an initiative is called the Business Schools for Climate Leadership, where HEC and INSEAD and IESC actually is a part of it where Mike is coming from. So that's, she got everything done for the COP26. She was our hero on stage over there. And we have the pleasure to have her here to, to model this panel today. So thank you so much for, for accepting this. Thanks. OK, welcome, everybody. Come closer. It's going to keep us warmer, more positive, more energetic. Come, come, and inclusive. 
Okay, okay, great. So, um, we had the fantastic lecture, right? And now